Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Another video podcast for you this week. This one with Kyle Forrest Burns of Burns Blossom Farm in Chico, California, which he farms with his wife, Mel. And he and I discuss all sorts of stuff from a very wild and somewhat debilitating diagnosis he received and working with that disease to nutrient management and tips for new farmers. It is a very cool talk that I've been wanting to have for several years and I hope that you enjoy it as much as I did. And if you do enjoy being able to see the conversation a bit and see some photos overlaid as we talk, let us know or just like the video. That works too. Make sure you are subscribed here to this podcast channel. And if you'd like to support our work, you can pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook or a hat or other merch at notillgrowers.com or become a Patreon member at patreon.com slash notillgrowers. All right, that's enough for me for now. Here's my chat with Kyle Forrest Burns of Burns Blossom Farm. Kyle Forrest Burns, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, I'm super excited to have you on. I, I've been wanting to get you on the podcast for what feels like forever now. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about where you are at currently on your farm and a little of the details of like, you know, what, what you grow, where you sell, those sorts of things. All right, sure. Yeah. So our current farm our newest farm hopefully the farm we stay at uh is in chico california uh it's in northern california in the sacramento valley it's the elevation is only like 250 in the valley so we're pretty darn low zone 9b um, we're right at the base of the sierra nevada foothills so just on the edge of the valley the soil here is you know prime agricultural soil it's where you know the bread basket um we farm two locations here one that we just purchased back in september and that's four acres it's uh in it's in the good soil the the vinyl loam that we've never got to farm on we've slowly been building up leveling up our soils started on sand and then the clay and then rocky loam and now we're now we kind of we were finally got to this point um pretty exciting but we also um lease another like acre plot that's more urban and that's on city water and that's been a little bit more challenging to figure that out but between the two farms we have nine unheated caterpillar tunnels uh six on our leased one and three on our new one so we're just kind of getting going on the new land it's a little bit complicated, but uh, yeah, that's that's the gist of it. Uh, we sell to some farmers markets in Chico, uh, grocery stores and restu- restaurants and co-ops, but a lot of our food also goes up to um, Nevada County, which is about an hour and a half away to the uh, Briar Patch Co-op up there. They contract with us um, to s- grow a lot of food up um up into the foothills as well as uh, we drop off up there to get our food up to the Tahoe Food Hub, um, which is essentially a food desert up in the Sierras. Um, So we were able to charge a little bit more to get our food up there. And um, we just got accepted into the Sacramento Farmers Market, uh, which is our state capital. So pretty excited. That's only about an hour away from where we are, just to give you an idea of where we're at. Nice, I appreciate that you all moved up in soil i feel like i did the opposite i I know like started with really good soil and then got pretty good soil and now we're on like clay muck um but you know that's that's sometimes how it goes because and then i think this is something that we is going to be sort of a theme of this particular conversation we've moved farms several times like i think this is our fifth farm technically um but i know you all have moved moved farms quite a few times too uh can you talk a little bit about where you've been before this point yeah sure so my wife and i by the way i farm with my wife mel mctavish uh we've been farming together this is our ninth season so um we when i first met her she was um working for a organic cut flower farm here in chico and i was always trying to start my own farm and i was pretty jealous that she was getting to work markets and 
uh, farm and I was like working construction and like trying to figure out how to start a farm. And I met her and I'm like, let's, we started dating and I was like, let's, uh, let's start a farm. Like, what are we waiting for? I'm kind of a, you know, dive right into, dive right into something full force. And, um, we, uh, we decided, we tried to, we did a road trip trying to figure out where we wanted to farm because Chico felt a little bit too saturated. Um, so we went to the, you know, drove all the way out to Colorado, went to the Northwest and we're like, nothing was really feeling right. And then we're super fortunate to have some family land on the Mendocino coast in Northern California. And we're like, well, why wouldn't we farm that if we have that opportunity? Um, super pr privileged. So we uh, sold everything we owned and started a farm from scratch. Um, we did some soil tests out there. It was uh, had a little bit of organic matter because it was old pasture, but super desiccated and compacted. And um, we started a farm and planted a cover crop in the fall, and this it never grew that year. Uh, because uh, it turned out the compaction was just crazy, and there's a superheated sandstone layer about 12 to 18 inches down that wasn't draining that we didn't really know about. But all it took was hand digging a bunch of raised beds, and it grew beautifully, um, combined with a lot of compost and amendments. But uh, we farmed that for about five years, and then uh, the pandemic hit. And right in the midst of that, we were in negotiations to buy our own piece of land in Mendocino on the coast. Uh, we The owner was going to carry the note. We had it all figured out. It had an old farmhouse we were going to fix up. It was kind of our dream. And with the pandemic, my wife being pregnant, we were like, is this really where we want to raise a family? Like in this isolated small community, like super supportive community, but it just felt a small community got smaller with the pandemic and we're about four hours away from the town we grew up in. And we're like, this just does not, you know, we could live here the rest of our lives, but will we be happy? And the answer is, yeah, we will be happy, but we could be closer to family and it would be easier. <laughs> so, uh, right at that same time, negotiating to purchase the land, we were offered the opportunity to lease an existing farm um in the sierra nevada foothills in nevada city and we thought well maybe this is a sign that we should move closer to family it's only we're only going to be an hour and a half from family instead of four hours so we uh chose the latter instead of purchasing land we leased again and moved uh our, our operation up to nevada city it was an existing business of about 20 years it had the markets it had the infrastructure of course, we were sleep deprived and we didn't really, from having a new baby um, and just <laughs> all that, we had got all excited about this opportunity. It's this beautiful farm in the Sierras, but um, we didn't really look too deeply into the actual infrastructure. And that's something I would definitely encourage people to dive into a little deeper. Um, it a lot of the infrastructure was aging out all the um, irrigation like the day-to-day -day management of that farm was very challenging it was a beautiful farm which i don't regret farming up there but we uh of some more issues came up there the new owner of the property told us they would sell it to us eventually and instead it, uh, they put it on the market and sold it for double what they bought it for we felt super burned by that. Um, finally, after that farm was sold, we made it through one season in the Sierra. Uh, it was very challenging. Uh, we were sandwiched between two large wildfires, lots of smoke, um, and yeah, lots of just big issues with the lease. So we left there after 10 months and moved to Chico and um, moved all of our we had put up nine caterpillar tunnels there. We moved six of them, sold three of them. We started fresh on two leased plots in Chico. 
And um, that's where we've been since. I mean, gosh, that is quite the journey you all have been on, especially with a newborn. When it comes to moving a farm, I'm imagining, especially doing it in that rapid succession, maybe you learned a few tips or tricks or things that you would do differently or approaches that you would take in terms of like moving all that infrastructure or setting up a new farm. Oh, we've, we were fortunate our first um, go around to have a barn um, and having that key infrastructure, like having a cupboard structure was that was centrally located in the middle of the property. It was, we had the efficiency already kind of tied in and we developed off of that and it was so helpful. And when we moved up to Nevada city, everything was just set up aesthetically gorgeous, but very complicated and nothing was efficient. So we knew that there was a better way. And then when we moved back to Chico, we're like, okay, let's go back to the way we were farming. Uh, what I didn't mention too is up in the Sierras, we were farming six acres of production. So we went from three quarters of an acre on the coast and scaled up to six acres. I was like, let's try this. Let's try tractor farming a bit. Um, still a lot of hand labor and hand tools. Uh, but I wanted to see what it was like. And it turns out I really like the smaller scale and I really like the intimacy it brings. Um, and I like getting my hands dirty. I don't like sitting on a tractor all day. Um, but, um, so now we're down back to our least plot is three quarters of an acre. Our new farm is four acres, but we're trying to, you know, we'll never have all four of those acres in production. It's, it's all in cover crop actually right now, which is very exciting and beautiful. But, um, the lessons learned from it are, I don't, I mean, they're, countless uh i definitely wouldn't recommend moving farms as many times as you might suggest <laughs> um but you know leases they're obviously so complicated and land access is very challenging in california uh i would say 10 years minimum for a lease if not longer um but, you know, the doing the due diligence of, you know, accessing your markets and the, and the farm's infrastructure, I think is so important. I'd be curious to know a little bit more, like you said, what did you say, like a minimum of a 10 year lease? Like what other things did you learn in terms of like setting up a lease? So we were fortunate to set up our lease in Nevada City through an organization here that helps with farm succession in California called California Farm Link. And they're very helpful and they really work with the landowner as well as the farmer to set up a lease that's beneficial for both sides. But because we were taking over an existing business, it was only a two year trial lease. And I had all these high hopes of doing, you know, it was a conventional organic farm, essentially. They would, you know, be a, they would plant the whole farm to cover crop in the winter. There was no winter production. And I had these dreams of moving there, doing a lot of winter production and doing no till. But then when I got there and we kind of had it worked into our, the lease language that based on our performance depended on if we would get an, an extended lease. Um, so I really was hesitant to implement a bunch of no-till on, on this farm and maybe let the landlord down and then him not re-sign our lease because of our experiments. Um, so we were, it was very, you know, challenging to just go from a no-till operation to a tractor farm where I was just tilling beds to get plants in the ground and keep the farm productive and be able to pay our bills. Um, it was a very expensive farm to lease. We were, we were paying $4,000 a month to um, farm up there. It was um, very cost prohibitive, but we made it work. Did that include living space? It did. Okay. 
That's so high. And and housing for employees, which was very beneficial. But yeah, it's so, yeah, leases are, you know, challenging. And so we were actually, we got out of that lease a year early because the farm went up for sale. And I was like, you know, we, we didn't lose anything from it. It was a mutually negotiated termination. Um, but so then we moved to Chico. Uh, we we uh, our current farm that we lease here. We have a ten year lease on it. And looking back, I'm like, ten years. We're already over two years into that, and it's going by so quick. We just got a structure built, a barn built on a metal barn. And I feel like it's just there's never enough time as a, as farmers and for all the investments you're making to the soil. You know, we got a grant to put a hedgerow in there. And it's so challenging to think about there's a termination point at some point, perhaps. And you're like, do I want to continue planting cover crops or do I want this land to just be super productive? But it will be more productive if I plant cover crops, you know. So, you know, you're constantly in conflict of all your practices. And at the end of the day, it's a business. So you have to make it profitable. Um, and the, yeah, <laughs> oh, that's, so, that, I mean, it's so much pressure. Like I feel, I mean, I, I, that just sounds painful to me to, to have to worry about how fast you have to get that infrastructure up to really take advantage of it, to make, to maximize a 10 year lease and then pull yeah. in profit that whole time. Yeah. It's very challenging. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still laughing though and having a good time. Yeah. And I think that goes without saying that I see a lot of farmers get into farming for the wrong reasons. And I think passion is what has led us to continue farming. Um, it, like I mentioned earlier, at the end of the day, it is a business, but being profitable is important, but if you don't enjoy farming, um, you're going to have a hard time making it through all the challenges associated with it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I, I feel like in my most frustrated moments with farming, like I still can't imagine doing anything else. And what I'm usually saying is like, I just want this part to go away for a minute so that I can enjoy the stuff that I'm doing. But like, usually that just takes a little work and <laughs> concentration. Um, but yeah, I mean, I get it. Like that's uh yeah, you can, I don't think you can because there are some of the stresses and challenges are very stressful or very challenging or very physical or very hot or very hard. So yeah, I mean, I get that. It's, it's tough. And I don't know if this is like a, a very, good transition to talking about this but um the other thing on top of all of this is that you found out that you had this very difficult disease in the middle of like this move to chico right or was it before that it was after our first season in chico so well for starters our yeah our first season in chico right in the summer i got an umbilical hernia and had to get surgery. (laughs) So I had a, I could, I couldn't farm for about three weeks. Just, I could barely just kind of walked around the fields. It was with a new crew. It was very green, but very, you know, supportive. And, um, that was in June, like very great time to have surgery. And then in December, right before Christmas, I had like a dull pain in my abdomen and I mentioned it to my brother-in-law and he's like, you know, that could be appendicitis. I was about, we were about to do a road trip. He's like, you might want to get that checked out. So that doesn't rupture on your trip. (laughs) I was like, so I went to the immediate care and I was like, Oh uh, yeah, I got this dull pain. They're like, it could be appendicitis, but we can't diagnose it. You need to go to the ER. So I went to the ER, you know, the whole four hour waiting period. And then you go in there and I'm kind of gearing up to be like, I'm going to have another stomach surgery. I got to get my an appendectomy. This is going to be great. Two stomach surgeries in a a year. And 
he's like, you know, it could be appendicitis, but it probably isn't, but it could be, but I would just like follow up with your primary care. And I was like, you know what? He's like, we could do a CT scan, but I wouldn't recommend it. And I was like, you know what? I'm here. I need to know what's going on. Let's do a CT scan. I kind of had to force him to let me do it. And we did that uh, CT scan and I came out of, he's like, well, the good news is there's not, there's nothing going on over by your appendix, but the other side of your stomach is, is a little concerning. Your lymph nodes are inflamed and he's like, you know, long story short is you got lymphoma. And I was like, excuse me. <laughs> and he's like, so he referred me to some cancer doctors and I left the emergency room at like 10 o'clock at night. And I walked out of there and I just like collapsed. So it was just, I was, you know, preparing for stomach surgery. And then I'm like lymphoma and like cancer and going through all the associated with that and having us, you know, being the, the primary farmer of the family and having a little child and just all that associated with it. Um, but anyway, I went to a cancer doctor, they did bone marrow biopsies, da, 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 lots of tests, couldn't figure out what was wrong with me, not lymphoma. Um, that's the good news. And then eventually ended up at a digestive diseases doctor and he saw my blood tests and he's like, he's like, well, you're severely anemic. Have you ever been tested for celiacs? I was like, no. He's like, he's like, okay, well, we're going to order that up and do a colonoscopy and an endoscopy. And I was like, oh, fun. And I mean, all it really took was the right doctor to see me to be able to figure out what was wrong with me. But turns out my uh, stomach was so damaged from eating gluten and drinking gluten my whole life that uh, I stopped absorbing iron almost entirely. And I was like severely anemic, like microscopic amounts left in my blood. And as you know, iron is, you know, it's it helps, it's it helps with your, with cognitive abilities and your sleep and all this that I was like, oh, that's why I'm tired. It's not because I'm a dad and I have a new business. It's also because I'm anemic. <laughs> uh, and it was, yeah, kind of uh, a tough time, but finding out what was wrong was great, you know, and now uh, I had, a, I've had a couple iron infusions. And, you know, everyone was like, oh, yeah, eat more this, eat more that. And I eat everything. The problem is that I don't absorb it. So the only way to get iron is through an infusion. So I, I kind of like to tell people about it because, um, you know, the more and more people I tell, the more and more people they go, my brother, my sister, everyone's got celiacs or somebody they know has it. And uh, so I'm like the celiac awareness guy now. <laughs> <laughs> Because about 25 to 30 percent, I think, of people with celiacs are anemic uh, due to the like, damage to their small bowel. So that's why I bring it up. But anyway, I've been gluten free has been pretty easy. Um, it's a bummer sometimes, but just because I hate denying food, but I love to eat <laughs> as as us farmers do. Yeah, that's intense. And so does it yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis, like, is it, does it affect like now that you have trouble with iron and stuff, like, does that affect your day-to-day, -day, you know, in terms of like, you mentioned you're, you know, can mess with cognition and like, I mean, in terms of like energy or being able to do the things that you have to do. It's very challenging to get like through a day without just wanting to take a nap. I get so tired. I sleep like super bad <laughs> and uh but i get a blood test every three months because that's the half-life of a red blood cell so they're able to keep track of it but my last blood test was like was like a week ago and sure enough my iron levels have steadily dropped and they're in the low range again since my last infusion so it's nice being able to know what's wrong with it and all this to say is that your gut can heal itself, but it can take like 12 to 18 months and I'm at about a year gluten free now. So hopefully we're on the mend, but, um, yeah, it's super challenging, like running a business. I do all the back end of the work, all the crop planning and just like always second guessing everything. 
and it just it's like being a procrastinator times like a thousand i just feel like everything has become so much more challenging i used to be able to just visualize everything on the farm and having like an impairment with with my cognition has just been so challenging but um i've just learned to adapt to it and drink lots of coffee (laughs) (laughs) oh Yeah, that, yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Cause it's, I think, um, you know, like I, I'm sure that's not easy to talk about, but it's also probably not easy to go through. And there are certainly other people and other farmers who have to deal with that. Well, I'm a chronic oversharer, as my wife would say. So I love uh, talking about anything. <laughs> uh, well, let's share some other stuff on farming while we're here. Um, is there, uh, you know, tell me a little bit in terms of like your production and your mixed with your climate, right? Like we grow similar crops, I imagine. Um, but I'm in like kind of a semi subtropical Kentucky where we're getting, you know, upwards of 70 inches of rain or 50 to 70 inches of rain every year. What is, yeah. I mean, like, can you talk a little bit about your particular challenges? Yeah, the challenges in, in California are there's just there's quite a few, especially as of late. Um, you know, with climate change, the heat has become very challenging. I think let's see, in twenty twenty two, we had sixty days over a hundred, um, and that we had a terrible tomato crop that year. You know, just. Yeah, and so much blossom drop on the tomatoes. Um, and so last year, what I just was like, I have to redeem myself for that. And um, tomatoes are huge. They're a number one crop. They weren't that year, obviously. But last year, we had a, a great tomato year. We had a more average summer, for lack of a better word. Um, but yeah, tomatoes are kind of king for us despite being in california where there are a lot of grown we we grow a lot of tomatoes i think we had let's see 2200 foot beds of tomatoes last year um and uh the other biggest issue with along with the smoke has been you know we have had these droughts prolonged droughts and um intense winter rains now all of a sudden the last two years and the smoke and the wildfires like that <clears throat> now we're i mean the other parts of the country are getting it from other fires but like when we farmed in nevada city for instance uh we farmed for three months with n95s not because of covid but because of smoke and respiratory issues um we had yeah, we were in between the Dixie and the Caldor fire. Um, and I mean, it was just raining smoke. They tried to cancel a farmer's market on us once in Truckee. And cause the AQI was over 500. And I was like, what are we supposed to do with our, this is, it was like August or whatever, you know, peak season. And they ended up not canceling market and it was our best market of the season people still showed up but it was raining ash the tablecloths were white you know uh butte county here where we're farming chico we're right below the town of paradise which is where i grew up and that's where the campfire was which was the deadliest wildfire in california history and that's my hometown that was burnt and we were farming on the mendocino coast at that time and I remember going to market after that, you know, we're, we're, we were four hours away from the, where that fire was burning in November. Um, and it was, our market was started at 3 PM, you know, the late afternoon and the street lights came on because they thought it, it was so dark that they had been triggered to turn on. It was like raining ash. <laughs> So, you know, the, the fires have been just so challenging mentally, you know, to be able to have to go out into that. So we're really trying to adapt our business to be more resilient to that. What does that look like? Well, so more winter production, 
you know, a lot of farms, even in California, take winters off still. And we're like, well, winter's pretty easy. Um, but uh, you kind of, you still have to, timing is, can be kind of tricky because we can have some warm spells in the winter. But, uh, and then also, you know, added value goods, like we're, we're making hot sauce and my wife makes fire cider and dried flower wreaths and wheat weavings um you know so just having a little bit of you know we're as small farmers you know our strength obviously lies in our diversity but you know continuing to diversify and have having some products in the winter um and we do seed garlic too i think that's a really great i i kind of came to that as Garlic is our favorite crop, but also I was like, well, that's a great um, task for our employees to do if it's smoky out. They can go inside a barn and clean garlic instead of huffing, you know, wildfire smoke while they're broad forking. <laughs> so um, that being said, the last two years haven't been that smoky. So, but don't get used to that. Yeah, right. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's gotta be wild. Other big, Oh, what was the, so, you know, you mentioned tomatoes, you mentioned garlic. What are some of the other crops that you. Oh, you know, we were, we try to focus on, you know, market gardening and bringing things to market. That being said, we're at our farm in Chico. We're only about 60% of our sales are farmer's market and 40 is wholesale. And we're trying to, it's, with the new farmer's market in Sacramento kind of go back into more direct. Uh, we're still figuring out our niche here in Chico. Um, so we, but you know, we try to do a lot of greens, bag greens and um, peppers, like I mentioned for hot sauce and garlic and all the root vegetables, you know, and we, we do a lot of the quick crops. That's, that's our bread and butter. We got to pay the bills. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Lettuce is like what affords us to be able to do all the ridiculous experiments that we do on our farm. That's what I, th <laughs> it's like the, it funds, it funds my ridiculous ideas. That's how I kind of think of lettuce in terms of, I think it'd be cool kind of to just elaborate a little bit on things like, especially when you're growing things like tomatoes and peppers, um, the, uh, like nutrient management stuff, because I think that's something that is, you know, kind of complicated for people, especially on those longer season crops, um, exactly how to, I don't know, like different approaches for like, you know, before you put that crop in while the crop is in the ground, like what, how are you measuring stuff? What, what's your sort of approach there? Sure. Yeah. I, uh, one of the biggest challenges we've had with nutrient management is we've always relied heavily on compost and quality compost. Um, here in Butte County, Northern California, it's a lot of conventional industrialized agriculture, and there is lots of compost available, but it's wood chip compost, you know, and that's it. That's the base. And it's carbon. That's great, but there's not much else in it. You know, we don't make very much compost. Um, so trying to source good compost here in the valley has been a little challenging although we got a grant last year that to be able to buy in some quality compost it helped fund it at least um and that is the basis of our fertility um and you know before we just like with any of our crops we try to layer on a, a whole lot of compost to start and kind of bring that soil to life a bit. Um, and we use, uh, we have always done at least annual soil tests. We use the Albrecht method. Um, we started using the Kinsey labs, uh, but um, you know, back on the coast, we used to do a lot of compost teas and we just haven't really had that set up again. So we've just been foliar spraying like fish emulsions and kelp uh, to kind of supplement those tomatoes to get them through the year. Um, but I really am looking forward to our new farm and having the 
opportunity to just kind of reset up our infrastructure to be able to make comp, you know, quality compost tea, as well as, um, as I mentioned, grants for compost. I also applied for a grant this winter to be able to make our own compost, like a lot of it. Um, I've been working a lot on grant writing this winter, like a lot. Uh, I'm really, after, you know, nine seasons of farming together, we keep moving and setting up farms and it's super challenging. And I'm really just trying to expedite that process a little bit by getting an influx of some grant money um, to be able to, to speed it up a bit. Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of interesting that, you know, you're doing the Albrecht method soil testing. And then are you also taking their guideline or taking their recommendations for nutrient balancing as well? Or are you just kind of doing your own sort of version of that? Or what does that look like? Well, I've always been a little bit of a mad scientist with uh, farming. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I like clean straight lines, but I don't string my beds. I like to, you know, adapt our crop plan to fit what's in demand and kind of just like, I'm kind of organized chaos is the approach I take to everything. And I try not, I try to get nerdy, but I also am kind of ADD about it. And sometimes I just, you know, I use my intuition to, to guide me um, and look at crop health. You know, I think so much of farming is, is visual and that's, how we farm a lot is just we grow crops that we think are beautiful we we keep crops in the ground that are looking vigorous and abundant and beautiful and it really helps guide me on our fertility management um so we do use our analysis a little bit but it's kind of a guideline and we steer with that you know we might on way more compost than they recommend because I don't want to be supplementing, you know, foliar fertigating all season. Um, I want a bank of nutrients in the soil as opposed to like constant applications of fertilizers. Yeah. So in terms of, so like you'll do that to set up the beds, you'll do the Soil testing to set up the beds, mostly adding compost, maybe some nutrients. Like, are you, you know, you mentioned like kind of taking it as a guideline. Are you buying in certain nutrients or what's that look like? Yeah. So for, I mean, with this whole health issue, I've had a really hard time keeping up on maintenance of crops. And so, you know, I used to foliar every week. Um, and I, I found myself the last couple of years just like being kind of getting to it when I could, but I'm really excited about this season. We have an employee that's staying on it and I'm dedicating him to staying on top of weekly um, crop management of like fertility and foliar feeding. So really excited to kind of gear that back to a, a more of a regular regimen. And you're not doing any sort of fertigation? Like you're not putting anything through the drip lines? No fertigation. No. Uh, that's interesting. It's just, it's, I don't know. It's somewhat, um, uh, I don't, I don't know what the word is like, uh, reassuring to hear somebody that relies so heavily on tomatoes be more like reliant on compost and just feel good about that and cut in foliar sprays, um, that are not particularly, it doesn't sound like they're particularly like complicated or, um, you know, geared around hyper specific nutrients or anything. Is that accurate? That's yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, we're not growing in any high tunnels right now. Um, I'm hoping to get some soon, but, um, with our last season, I think we grew 35,000 pounds of tomatoes, harvested that, sold that, sold 35,000 pounds. Um, and that, you, you know, is so we really focus on those crops and give them a lot of attention and pruning and, but it, I don't get too nerdy about it. Um, I really let my intuition guide me on the crops and, and how their, their vigor is 
and what they may need. I mean, it sounds like you're doing a lot of your nutrient and management across the fields, like with compost. Is there anything else that you're doing special that you feel like is like, has made a huge difference for you? Well, one thing that I'm really excited about for our future of techniques of farming, you know, we really, we do a lot of paper potting and jang seeding and, um, really for all of our transplanted crops or a lot of them, I really want to gear more towards like grown in place mulch. We did some experiments with that and that's been, nothing's ever felt more right to me than like terminating rye and planting into moist soil in the middle of summer. Uh, we did our winter squash like that last year and it made me so happy. I just felt like this is the future of our farm and it makes so much sense in the hot and dry um, California climate to be importing less um, inputs as well as just like the ease of it and walking on that mulch. It just like, <laughs> it was a dream. I've never been so intrigued by um, a, a growing practice is that. Talk about cover crops a little bit more. Cause I feel like, I mean, for us, it's not cover crops are not complicated in that, you know, we have the moisture to germinate them most times. Um, you know, they have the moisture they need all winter and then, you know, it's pretty hot, pretty fast and they decompose quickly, but like, they're not that hard to kill. Like it is complicated, but it's, I imagine, so like with you all, you are having to irrigate those? Like what's your sort of procedure for getting a good cover crop stand over the winter? So we, we really, we wait to time, we time it with our first winter rains or fall rains. Um, you know, we have grown them in tunnels, so then we can irrigate them with our overhead sprinklers. But uh, yeah, cover crop, we haven't, got to do much summer cover cropping and that's something we will be doing on a new farm now that we have the, the land and I really want to focus on the soil out there now that we own land. Um, but the, for like a winter cover crop, we're able to, you know, plant it in anywhere from October through December and it grows all winter because our, we rarely get below 28 degrees in the winter. Um, and then we, you know, with the rye to, we, uh, the way I terminated it last year was I just rolled over it with our VCS flail mower just to add some weight to it. You know, I see a lot of people crimping it with T posts. And to me that just, especially with just like my lack of energy it, and I say lack of energy, but I still have quite a bit, <laughs> but like, it just seemed like so much work. And so I rolled over it and I just threw a tarp over it. And with our hot California summer sun, it, it killed it um, in a couple of weeks with the uh, occultating it. And it worked like a dream. You know, we don't have to irrigate it because we have winter rains. You know, we get anywhere from, you know, 20 to 30 inches of rain. Oh, okay. So you get a decent amount of rain over winter. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, I found, you know, we use our, you've probably seen it or the listeners probably seen it in our videos, the, um, like the rotary plow with the tines moving, but you don't even yeah. have to move those tines. That rotary plow on the VCS is like, I don't know, 250 pounds or something. It's like very heavy implement. And that's off, uh, often as long as the rye is tall enough, um, enough to just smash it down. And then we throw a tarp over top of it. Um, yeah, I found that I, I just felt really bad asking my employee to do, <laughs> to do that in the heat. Cause here, in, like, it's one thing if you're doing it up North, but here, like when we're crimping rye, it can be 90, 95 degrees. And it's just like a hundred percent humidity and it's just brutal. So it's like a lot to ask of somebody, uh, in Kentucky in our climate. So yeah, I'm usually just like, let's just get the BCS out and smash that. Thing yeah. It, if it goes quick and it, you know, with the tarp, it just works magic. And then you're just, and that was for, what were you planting into that? You said, uh, winter squash. squash. And it wasn't too, like one of the things that people, I mean, here and a little bit further north have challenges with like stomping down a cover crop and then planting winter squash uh, because the soil is too cold. But I'm guessing there in California, like a 
between the tarp and the just general warmth, it's probably, that's probably not an issue. No, I mean, it's, it's, uh, February right now and it's 65 degrees out, you know, we, it's a warm day. We got our soil temps warm up pretty quick in the spring. Yeah. Oh, that sounds nice. <laughs> it, it, it can be good, but the problem is we get in January and February, we get these false springs where you're, you know, last week it was seven, almost 75, which of course record breaking heat, but you just get, you're like false spring. Oh, like we're behind, we're behind. You start freaking out, trying to get on all your infrastructure projects. And then it gets back down to, you know, 50 during the day and 30 at night. And that's cold to us. We're like, burr. <laughs> yeah, it's um, right now it's a little warmer here in Kentucky, but we're still low 50s and the soil temperatures are very low. And we will get probably at least a couple more times down into the teens at, at night. So there's only so much we can do until like March here. Like I'll start planting out in the fields in March, but um, beyond that, like it's a, you know, we, we can't, we can go over winter, but it's in the tunnel and it's a lot of covering and uncovering. Um, mm -hmm. So you said nine B is what you all are. We're here. We're yeah. six B seven A cuspers like literally like down our street is like a winding thing of six B seven A. So like, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit tough to get stuff through the winter, but we're, I don't know, increasingly able to do it, but also just, um, yeah, getting stuff early is difficult for us, especially, yeah, in conjunction with cover crops, but. No, it's, it's tricky. And like the, I mean, we're, we see it carrots last week, but I, to help them, I see them outside. We, we covered them with the tarp to help warm up the soil a bit to speed up the process. But our two farms <laughs> that we have are two miles apart, but the uh, one we own is usually about four to six degrees colder um, at night because it's out in the valley a little bit deeper. And the other one's urban and has a lot it, it retains a lot more heat at night. So it's challenging to go from one farm to the other and be like, what's, you know, what kind of frost did we get? <laughs> and looking at weather predictions is, you know, you always err on the side of caution. That's fascinating. It's almost like you can kind of run a trial between the different growing conditions of, yeah. Cause that's a pretty, yeah. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, that's not, that seems small, but that's like, can be a very significant difference. Oh yeah. I mean, the difference for us, like it, we can get a frost at 38, but if you get two or four degrees warmer, like you're not in, you're not likely to get a frost. So yeah, that's the challenge. One of the questions you had on there is about, you know, what people could like learn, you know, things, anything people could take away from our experiences. And one thing I think that would really has helped us is grants um, in general. Uh, I think it's, you know, having a farmer network and not being afraid to reach out to people. Like obviously your podcast helps an immense amount of people, but then like, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, you're not in this alone. And, uh, grants are one of those, uh, ways to help facilitate, um, making your farm succeed. You know, our new farm, we just got a hedgerow grant. It's like almost $50,000 and it pays us to plant it too and maintain it. It's 800 plants, you know, and that's something we wouldn't do for years if we didn't get that grant, but it's something we would do, but we get to do it our first year of owning the farm, you know, what, where did you get, do you have any recommendations in terms of where like you look for grants or what grants are that people are overlooking or where that one came from? The community Alliance of family farmers, CAF in um, California, they have a database of what grants are currently active and they don't even, they don't have everything, but they have a lot. And then, you know, we, we got one through uh, this organization point blue conservations, service that uh they got money from the state to get um they got money from the state 
to um, build wildlife res resilience on working landscapes. And so that's the hedgerow grant is to bring, you know, some pollinator habitat onto, you know, ranches and farms throughout the state. Um, but yeah, the NRCS, of course, and um, if you're certified organic, which I highly recommend um, for anyone who doesn't like record keeping, uh, it really will help you become a better record keeper as well as make your business a little bit more structured. Um, they, you know, CCOF offers, offers a, um, hardship grant every year, you know, on the last year, $10,000 to, if you had a hardship and it's like, who doesn't have a hardship every <laughs> single year on a farm? <laughs> yep. Uh, that's good to know. That's a good grant. I, I generally, I mean, depending on how you're selling your food, recommend people being certified organic. If that, especially for farmers markets and stuff, I feel like it's a no brainer. Yeah. Are there other areas that's helped you just out of curiosity? What grants or what are being certified organic? organic. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, at our farmer's market, it's, you know, a 30, 40 year old market. We're the one of only three certified organic farms there. And so we instantly got a following just based on, oh, you're organic. And even two years later, people find our booth and go, oh, are you new here? You know, are you certified organic? That's so great. That's so amazing. And it, a lot of people seek out that label despite, you know, it's, there's a lot of issues with that. We have the real organic project add on label too. Um, but yeah, it's been a huge, huge boon to our business. Um, the co-op we sell to up in Grass Valley, they only buy certified organic. Um, so we have to be certified to sell there. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a marketing strategy, I believe, you know, it really helps, but yeah, I wouldn't. And of course I wouldn't be where we're at without my wife, Mel, um, helping me guide through all these health issues and our, our business and, raising a child and raising farms together. So feeling so fortunate always to have a partner in yeah, this. Absolutely. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and chatting with me. I, uh, I greatly appreciate your time and, uh, I have had a blast hearing about your farm. Yeah, dude. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. You can follow Burns Blossom Farm at Instagram and all the places if you are new to our work. We have a whole video channel on here that you can check out that has more technical videos and less podcasty videos. And like this podcast if you like this podcast. If you are not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Support our work by picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook or a hat or other merch at notillgrowers.com or become a Patreon member at patreon.com slash notillgrowers where at a certain level or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Spencer Carter, Ricky Kennedy, Derek Page, Chris Yates, Sean at All About the Garden, Stephen Smith and Cameron Pribel. Huge shout out to everyone who supports us in whatever way that you can, even just sharing this video or one of our podcasts in your Facebook group about bird watching. They'll love it. Otherwise, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.